Championship Commons briefing today as we like to do on Mondays. It's an Ask Me Anything with um, either a project or an upstream project or a product or a new initiative someone's kicking off. And this week we have um, a new community manager, Melanie Kaur, with us, who's getting the pleasure of managing and herding cats for Pulp and Foreman. Um, so welcome, Melanie. And um, we have two folks, um, Eric Helms from um, the Foreman Project and Dennis Kilden from the Pulp mm -hmm. Project. <laughs> I think, yeah, it's right there in front of me on the screen. I should be able to see it. Um, and these are faces that many of you probably have known and seen um, in different aspects of, of Red Hat projects and products and stuff. And Pulp and Foreman both have been around for a while. Um, and are very heavily used inside of Red Hat and outside of Red Hat. So I'm really psyched to have them come here to give us an update on what's going on in each of these projects and for Melanie to um, take over the reins of managing these, um, these cats. And so Melanie, tell us a little bit about where you came from in your new role, and then um, let's, uh, let's rock and roll, learn more about Foreman and Pelt. Thank you, Diane, and thank you very much for having us all here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so first of all, yeah, my name is Melanie Kaur. I have been with Red Hat for just over three years now, and I've been working as a community manager for almost exactly six months. Been quite interesting. So before community management, I was working with uh, Red Hat Satellite on the documentation team, uh, leading that team for about 18 months. Um, so I suppose the, the bit of background, um, the Foreman project itself is 11 years old and from a lot of that time they had a dedicated community manager. When that community manager, Greg Sutcliffe, decided to start exploring a career in data analysis, um, a lot of the, the roles were divided amongst different people for the community, but then after about a year they decided it was best to maybe dedicate someone full time because I and for the last six months I can see that it's there's an enormous amount of herding cats, an enormous amount of traffic on our discourse um, to ensure that our community kind of well served and people get answers to their questions and demos run. And um, I think it is important to have somebody kind of leading that um, herding, poking people. So it's it's been it's been an interesting few months. And then on the other hand, there's pulp. Uh, which is also a very interesting project and also feeds into um, Foreman and I've been working with them to maybe grow the community a little bit more. So this year has been also extremely interesting because we haven't had any uh, live or in-person meetings or conferences. So we're all here together from all different parts of the world um, meeting in, in new ways. So that has been particularly interesting. We had our first ever live, uh, uh, our first ever virtual PulpCon this year and our first ever Foreman birthday party and so I was I was quite excited and um, delighted that we got to meet so many faces we wouldn't have otherwise and I think unless Diane you have any particular questions I think that's pretty much everything um, that I can say to introduce myself at this point so if not I'd be very happy to hand over to Eric Helms for his first um, demo or piece. All right, Eric, that's great. Well, welcome aboard and um, thank you for taking on that challenge, Melanie. Um, uh, it definitely is and PulpCon and um, birthday, the birthday parties are always fun for Foreman. So Eric, tell us a bit um, and about yourself and then maybe um, quickly Dennis so you know he doesn't feel left out and then we'll go run into um, your, your presentation about what's going on in, in Foreman and where it's going. Okay, uh, so I've been at Red Hat for like nine and a half years, and I started as an intern working on uh, what is now a plug-in to Foreman, but you could effectively say I've been working on part of Foreman uh, and its downstream product uh, that Red Hat makes called Satellite for the whole nine and a half years that I've been here. Uh, and uh, so I've seen a lot through the community, and um, you know, more, more recently I moved into the an architect role within Satellite, the product, so I get to you know, look at the ecosystem with a different light and think more about uh, uh, how, we, how we build and how we shape the community. All right, Dennis, you're up. 
tell us about your role and how you came yeah, here. Yeah, so I'm a senior software engineer. I've been with Red Hat for about seven and a half years. Uh, I started out working on a project called Image Factory uh, that uh, was part of Cloud Forms. Uh, however, when I joined, uh, we had purchased a company to replace Cloud Forms. So uh, I had to find another project to work on, and I ended up working on Pulp, which was great because I was already friends with the folks that worked on Pulp. They sat near where I sat, so I felt like I was part of the team before I even joined. Um, and so I've been working on Pulp for six years, I guess, maybe more. Uh, and for a lot of that time, we've uh, been rewriting Pulp. And I'll talk about the rewrite of it whenever it's my turn to go after Eric. All right. Well, thanks. And I'm really grateful that you're all here today. So um, thanks very much. And it's wonderful to see faces um, from all the teams too. So Eric, um, why don't you give us your um, spiel and your, your talk about where Foreman's at today? Um, it's nice having the historical perspective too. So take it away and share your screen and um, we'll rock and roll. Right, I will do my best uh, while I get that Sharon. A fun fact, Dennis and I worked at a lab on North Carolina State's campus before we both moved on to Red Hat. Yep. <laughs> we, have a, we have a long history together and we just happened to land here doing this together. Yep, I'm, I was so glad to see that you were the one I'm doing a talk with. <laughs> All right, uh, just check that you can see that. We can see it, but it's not full screen yet. So if you pop it into full screen, there you go. Perfect. All right. Take it away. All right, so um, try to give my best uh, view of what uh, Foreman is um, and some of the evolution as I talk through what it is and why you might want to consider using it. Um, so you can think of it, plug it into your brain that it is the life cycle management tool aiming for your data center and the hybrid cloud. Uh, it's going to give you a single place uh, that you can come manage all your various real estate and concerns uh, in the same way and in the same place. Um, <clears throat> you can uh, look at this from a of a green field or a brown field perspective, depending on you know where you're at in your evolution, um, whether you're an individual or a group or a company, uh, whether you're new or existing, um, <clears throat> you can approach it and you can look at it, you know, kind of a lot of s similar ways. At least towards the end of the story, becomes the same in in both cases. It's just a matter of kind of how you start. So think of, and I'll go into, you know, what these things kind of mean or how we look at them as, a, as the Foreman project. Um, but you start by, uh, you know, defining what it is that you want to, what you're planning to create. You know, is it a web server? Is it a database server? Is it, where does it live? Is it, you know, on a cloud provider? Is it on bare metal that you have? What are the properties of it, your networks, uh, your domains, your subnets, uh, maybe what content it has, you know, RPMs, uh, files that you want on the machine. You can create what you, what, how you would define these things. And then if you're in a greenfield situation, you know, you can start by trying to define these things. Then you can move to provisioning bare metal hosts, those cloud machines, based on the definition that you created. Um, and once it's provisioned, move on to a configuration step where you're applying how you want the machine to look, what software you want on the machine, how you want it configured, what things you maybe want it connected to. Uh, and at that point, it is you know, talking back to and part of Foreman's inventory, and then you can move on to active management of that machine. Uh, through its life cycle, whether you need to apply updates, whether you need creation of it, put new software on it, reprovision it, you know, maybe 
you want to move it to a different cloud, so you want to reprovision it after you've updated your definition. Um, you can also look at this from uh, you know a brownfield case where you've already got some real got stuff in your data center or in the cloud, and you want to start to move to managing it um, from a single place, or you're planning uh, say you're planning to expand and scale. Uh, so you want to start managing stuff from a single place so that you can start to scale out maybe certain types of deployments that you have. And, and in that case, you can import uh, the existing machines you have through a variety of mechanisms to get into those. <clears throat> and then once you've imported them, you can start to build out your definitions, just like the Greenfield case. You know, you can use the data and the attributes from the import process to then define you know, what operating systems you have, domains, your subnets, your software. Uh, and then you can start to configure those machines. You could even go back sort of to the greenfield path and provision new machines based on those definitions. And, you know, end up in sort of the active management state uh, where you're monitoring the configuration and you're making changes and you're looking at reports and you're um, keeping an eye on things and, <clears throat> you know, applying security changes and configuration changes and doing all of the life cycle of your hosts and systems through just, you know, a single point of view, which is Foreman. Um, so, you know, from that, what does it, what does kind of form and look like? What are you trying to deploy? You know, what are some other, like, when you think about the aspects of it, like, this is, this is kind of our old school. Uh, you could say uh, this is very uh, part of the history of form and this image has been around for like seven or eight years in the architecture. It has evolved, but it hasn't really changed from the central concept that you have. You have a central form and server that's receiving uh, reporting and data and information from various sources. You've got a web UI, you've got this rich AI, API. Um, and then there's a piece of software called the Smart Proxy, which is a serves a number of purposes. So you might install a form and server, and then you might go install a Smart Proxy on a different machine. And how you deploy that machine may depend on your network topology or what you're trying to achieve. You can deploy a smart proxy with the idea that you want it to sit at the edge of your data center. Uh, so you can deploy different smart proxies to different, you know, different data centers at the edge of those different data centers or cloud. So you can use it as the sort of like isolated communication to anything inside that network. Um, and the smart proxy can talk back uh, to Foreman. Um, it also provides um, a, a sort of RESTful API to things that traditionally don't have web-based APIs, you know, DNS, DH, some DHCP, TFTP, um, some providers that you would typically have to SSH into the box or run or configure that way. Uh, the smart proxy provides a way to do that through a common API for those at all, uh, and as well, it provides a sort of like a, an abstracted API over different providers. So you can really start to build up common patterns and API to your advantage or use it, you know, like for isolation, for scale out, offloading uh, a number of hosts that are being managed or routing traffic through. Uh, this applies when we get to some of the like also cache send out content so like rpms files uh, debian push out content to those things so they're much closer if you have networks that are unreliable you can push it out uh, the data out there so it's closer to the machines that need to get it rather than each and every one of them having to reach all the way back to foreman uh, to get that data um, and we'll talk more about that as we come along um, so let's look at a little bit of each of those topics, give kind of a, an idea of like how Foreman looks at it and how you would create these things, how you would, uh, how it provides some tools for organizing your data, viewing your data, um, <clears throat> your definitions. So if we start, just start with the defined state, we have this concept called a host group. 
Uh, you can define lots of attributes on a host group. You can define environments, the content, what config management provider you want to use, whether it's Ansible or Puppet or Salt or Chef, domain, subnet, OS, architecture, all the things that go into how you define what this machine is or when you provision it or you configure it. Um, host groups are nested, so you can create different layers, different concepts, and you can organize it how you want to organize it. So maybe you want to organize it in a way where you're creating what a base level RHEL 7 host looks like. And then on top of that, you're building out what your web server looks like, um, what software is on the web server, what configuration go <clears throat> specifically to what your web server looks like. Um, or maybe you want to think about it a different way where the uh, concept is the thing that doesn't change, but the OS changes. And so you want to start with, here's how I'm going to define what our Jenkins nodes look like. You know, the content that's on them, the layout on the file system, uh, the puppet modules I want to apply to it, or the playbooks I want to run on it. And then you might have small variations that you want to apply on top of that if you happen to have a node that's running RHEL versus one that's running. Debian. So really host groups provide this way to configure and define what your hosts look like so that you can, you know, provision multiples of them. You can make updates and then run updates across them. You can, you know, scale those deployment types out. Um, then there's other, uh, you know, so I hadn't mentioned this, but so, uh, you know, Foreman started itself as a way to manage a UI and a way to manage Puppet, and then it brought a lot of provisioning capabilities on top of it. Then it built out a kind of plugin ecosystem, uh, and that plugin ecosystem brings in a lot of power and functionality. And I've got a, a good little list of that later to kind of give an idea. So some of what I talk about, for example, content, comes in from a plugin and uh, is, a good setup for when we get to Dennis, because the content side of things is driven and powered by Pulp. And what we provide for Foreman um, is some abstractions and some layers on top of that to help with how you define your content, how you customize your content, how you think about doing lifecycle management with your content. So you can, as part of this definition thing, just define what repositories you want, you know, is it, you know, do you want to Fedora? Do you want uh, RHEL? Do you want Ubuntu? Uh, what other kinds of content? You know, do you want to store and manage just files, right? That could be anything from something like SSH keys or even, you know, VM images. Maybe you want to keep those together. Maybe you want to life cycle, you know, your, your uh, Vagrant boxes as an example of something we do internally as part of our development cycle. Maybe you want Ansible content. Maybe you want container images. Um, you can define what those repositories are, what that content is, and you can use this concept called content views to further customize it. So um, say you sync down, you, you want to be a, a rail shop and you want to customize that rail, um, or you want to lock it down to certain Know, kernel modules or something like that. That's, you know, these are use cases that people do it and content views in this definition allow you to do that. Um, then you can get into the defining on a config management side by choosing what provider. And so Foreman started as a, with Puppet integration, but over the years, people have added plugins that provide all of the other providers out there. So uh, you may define and want to set what Puppet classes or Ansible roles or Chef cookbooks or salt states that you want applied to your system whenever you, you know, provision it or update it. And then you can go into this very, you know, hardy parameter management as well, where you can define, you know, what is the key value for these inputs to these configuration artifacts. <clears throat> um, you know, after you've defined what you want, then you can get into the visioning uh, space, um, which Foreman has been doing for a long time. Um, you can do bare metal virtual provisioning. You can pixie. You can do it through image-based provisioning. 
Um, there's a plugin that's known as Discovery, which provides this concept, the metal as a service concept, which, you know, is kind of the idea that you can go uh, plug in a brand new bare metal machine and it will call out and register itself back to Foreman. And then based on a set of rules that you've set up, it can automatically provision itself. So you plug it in, it boots up, it reaches out, provisions itself based on your set of rules, and it's just ready to go. Um, there's a number of compute resources that we support that come in through plugins, you know, the various cloud providers, various virtualization providers, um, you know, um, there's uh, plenty out there that we support today and, and individuals, teams, businesses can come in and add support for any of the, that concern them if they're not on the list already by creating you know, a plugin. Um, so the other way, right, in the brownfield ideas is, is uh, say you don't want to define and provision, but you've got all these machines that exist out there in the world. Uh, maybe you're managing them for through Chef. Maybe you're managing them through, through Puppet. Um, maybe Ansible. You can import the machine, uh, you know, the hosts out there back into Foreman to start to get your landscape, your inventory all together. Um, through through their kind of you know native methods, really, it's just about sending facts and information about that machine back to Foreman, and there's various integrations for each of these out there. Um, um, you know, Puppet being Foreman's you know original use case where Puppet facts and reports would send back, and now you can manage that host through uh, native Puppet methods. We got the uh, Red Hat side with Subscription Manager, um, and then there's Curl up there because uh, I mentioned this when we get to like what's upcoming. We're working on a more generic way. If you don't use one of these providers, configuration providers, a, a more global, direct way. We're calling global registration to get import a, a, a host into Foreman for active management. Um, on the configuration side, so we've kind of talked a, bit, a little bit about this so far, right? But like the main drivers for configuration is what is your config management solution? Is it Puppet? Is it Ansible? Is it Chef? Is it Salt? Is it possibly something something else? You know, these are like I think the four big ones, but uh, it could be other homegrown ways that you want to manage it, or it could be that you want to take. Um, what I'll mention in a minute, which is a remote execution route, but um, there's plugins and ways that these are each supported so that you can assign them to your hosts or assign them to your host groups, um, apply the ones that matter. You know, if, you're web, if you have your web server case, you can, you know, have Ansible roles um, that set up Apache for you, or you could have your Chef cookbook that sets up, say, Nginx for you on the machine, and when it's provisioned, or if you assign it to the host, it'll get run, and it'll get picked up and run by that particular config management solution, which will also then send back, you know, reports and data about what happened and what's new and what's changed, what are the facts on the machine. Um, you can get into defining parameters and their values, then you can change them. Apply that configuration, you know, key value management that get seen as inputs into those things, which allow you to sort of scale out managing different kinds of configurations and, and systems. Um, if you, you know, either don't have a config management solution or you look at things um, more as I just run something on the machine at, at a time when I need to run it. Um, and then I just keep an eye on its configuration, make updates. You can use the remote execution, uh, which comes through from a plugin. Um, this provides the ability to just go run, uh, you know, user-defined bash scripts um, through the templating uh, engine and templating language that's inside of Foreman. Um, or you can run Ansible playbooks or Ansible roles. Um, this is both of those currently happen through um, SSH, um, but they're both still backed by the templating system. I haven't really mentioned yet, but 
Um, it, it shows up in a lot of places in Foreman and has a lot of power. So provisioning is very template driven. You can define templates for all stages of provisioning that will get you know, generated based on parameters and then executed on the hosts. Same with remote execution, you can define a, whatever batch script you want in a template with variable inputs coming from Foreman from its rich set of data um, that get executed. Same thing with the playbooks um, and the roles. Um, and then also here in the past couple of releases, there's been some uh, uh, reporting that's been present, uh, given to the user where they can define, use the same kind of templating idea to generate reports of what is within, you know, Foreman's database, within its inventory, um, that then can be, you know, exported and, and looked at or, you know, done whatever a user needs to do with that sort of information of, of everything that's going on. Um, and then you can also, um, through the Catello plugin, have there's this concept of lifecycle environments um, where you can choose that your hosts are in the dev environment or the test environment, production environment, and you can uh, push content through those environments. You can make choices based on what environment uh, the hosts live in. Uh, so say you're rolling out a new software update, you can roll it out to your dev environment. Hosts that are in your dev environment could get, you know, updated through say remote execution to get that new software. You could then go out and test it, look at uh, reports coming back, Foreman about what's happening in that environment. And when you feel good about it, you can roll that update into maybe the QA environment or just straight out to production uh, and then go issue either updates, like I said, through remote execution or say you're using Puppet uh, by rolling it out to production, you know, your Puppet and, uh, you know, Puppet agent out there wakes up and says, oh, hey, there's updates, um, I'm gonna apply them and now those systems are up to date and sending reports and information back. Um, for the, you know, active management side of things. And uh, there's a lot that you can do with the active management, right? You can still, like that's what, you know, I mentioned iterating through dev test prod. Um, you can then, you know, be thinking about inspecting your inventory, looking at the systems, what status they're in, what's new information coming through. Um, lots of different, you know, there's reporting mechanisms, stuff coming from the configuration provider itself, you know, Puppet reports, Ansible runs, reporting back uh, the what you know what happened during the run. Uh, there's Open SCAP integration for compliance reporting through a plugin. Um, you can schedule tasks. So say you want to apply, you know, Yum update on every Sunday at midnight, for example. You set up something to go run and do that for you. Uh, you can also set up how off frequent you want to sync new content or you can manually sync content you know when you want to go apply security errata if when they're synced down or brought in um, when you want to do updated os and application software it, it really gives you the tools and the power to figure out and decide how you want to do it based on your needs and schedule around that um, and then also add you know it's it's um, has a lot of enterprise uh, level features that have been added to it over the years and supported and you can you get to manage those things too you know users roles um, what we call organizations which is a way to like sort of segment all your systems um, locations which add you know you can add the metadata around an organization around where the systems are SSO um, so a lot you can do once you get everything in there, you know, to actively manage it, keep applying configurations, keep your systems healthy, deploy new versions of those systems. So that's uh, that's sort of like a, a pretty, I think, kind of high level overview of trying to like tell the story of what you can do with Foreman. You know, I, I like to think of it that you can do a lot with Foreman, but there's a lot involved with 
you know, defining what a system looks like, provisioning it, actively managing it, keeping on top of security updates, keeping it from drifting with, you know, having configuration drift, uh, having it look and feel and do the things that you need it to do. And, and Foreman has a lot to help you with that and handle all of the ways that that can, a lot of the ways that that can be done. I won't say all of the ways that it's done. Um, and do it from one place so that you're able to manage different footprints largely in the same way uh, and reduce the amount of, of effort you have to put into managing those things, especially as you start to, you know, scale up to the hundreds, thousands, uh, even 10,000s of machines under management. Um, and then I'll just kind of give some, I think, ecosystem highlights for anybody curious at that level about Foreman, um, it does have an API. Uh, I, I, I label it as, I like to think of it as ways that you can help you automate and scale out your Foreman deployment and your use of Foreman. We have, there's the API, uh, there's the CLI, which is known as Hammer. Um, and then over the past year or so, we've been building out an Ansible collection known as Foreman Ansible modules that provide a set of Ansible modules that you can use to automate uh, against your form and instance. Um, <clears throat> it's a couple technical items, so it is a very heavy Ruby-based um, project. Uh, the UI is predominantly these days, uh, there's some old school JavaScript and ERB templates, but there's a lot of uh, newness being written in React. Um, but both the Foreman and the Smart Proxy, which are the two, I'd say, main, you know, software projects, and then plugins after that are all written in Ruby. Uh, Foreman is based, is a Rails application. Um, there is a, a robust installer that is based on um, a set of Puppet modules, kind of hearkening back to Foreman's roots, uh, the installer provides an interface and an installation experience, but it's on top of a set of puppet modules where each one is built to deploy the various services um, that someone might want. Um, there, the project does provide RPM and Debian-based packages for each of it anytime there's a, a release. Um, you can go to the foreman.org is the main website community.theforman.org is our discourse instance where you can find support, RFCs for any new features, uh, development discussions, infrastructure related items. Uh, and then you can go to the main GitHub org at slash the foreman. Um, yeah, so I mentioned I'd, I'd kind of give you an idea of like, okay, so what is built through plugins? Because I think that's, there's a lot of power in plugins. They allow individuals or teams, even and, and companies, to go build additional functionality. Um, you know, sometimes we see these plugins show up in the community, uh, show up in the open source. We also know that in some cases, businesses build stuff for their internal needs and they keep it, you know, closed source because they're specific to their workflows that they're building off of Foreman. Um, but you have probably the biggest plugin, which is Catello. Um, it does content and entitlement management. It is the main interface to the Pulp project, which is doing all the heavy lifting content under the hood, which Dennis will give us lots of good details about. There's plugins for Salt, Chef, Ansible, configuration management providers. Uh, I, remember, I mentioned remote execution, discovery, if you wanna do, you know, provisioning uh, through metal as a service, you know, plug-in provision based on rules, open SCAP for open SCAP compliance. Um, there's a web hooks plugin in the works. There's plugins for cloud providers, um, for vault integration, if you want, you know, to do secrets management alongside your host that you're provisioning. Um, and I think what is my last slide here is to give you an idea of what is the roadmap and how does Foreman release? So it's a three month release cycle. Uh, again, RPM and Debian based releases. Current release is Foreman 2.1 and the 2.2 release is in the RC phase. 
Um, and then looking ahead, we are looking towards a Foreman 3.0 uh, in the future. And say the, the the biggest reason we're looking ahead to that is because, um, like I've said, part of its Foreman's history, it's you know, has been its Puppet integration, which was built into Foreman. Um, and so there's a team working hard to pull out the Puppet to a plugin, uh, which puts it on the same footing as the other configuration management providers and provides a little more, you know, cohesive experience for what your config management provider is, um, and pull, puts a little more focus on the main form and app to be, you know, the place that bring allows you to do provisioning, brings your inventory in, and has integration points um, for these different import methods, these different uh, you know, providers that can send facts and tell you about a host. Um, the Catello project is doing a big migration uh, to Pulp 3 for its content, and that make make a lot more sense when I hand it over to Dennis in just a minute. Uh, the Global Registration API, which is going to allow you to not necessarily have to have a, you know, provider such as Ansible or Puppet or Subscription Manager to import a host, you can do it through their through this new global registration API and it enables more workloads. Webhooks plugin on the rise, um, and then um, a lot of some look into reworking some some older UI pages that haven't seen been touched in many years. Um, looking towards a, a, a focus on sort of what user workflows, rather than just providing maybe information and, and how things were seen seven eight years ago. We're looking to say, how do we enable users to have more guided, better workflows with those uh, primary UIs? <clears throat> and that, while it felt short to me, was probably a fairly long spiel uh, that I will end the Foreman segment with there. Um, and I guess turn it over to Dennis. Yeah, I think that that was great. I really appreciate that um, the insights uh, and. And it's I've been a long time since I've uh, looked at Puppet stuff and Ansible stuff and all salt stuff. So it's really a good refresher for me. So um, thank you. And uh, and I, I really do like the single pane of glass for um, the monitoring as well. So sometime we're going to have to get you on and do a demo of all that. Really, really well done. So Dennis, cue up um, Pulp and tell us how Pulp fits into this puzzle. Um. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't have any slides. I have we have our website uh, that I can share in a little bit, but I just uh, want to give an overview of Pulp. And Pulp is a platform. I think of it as actually as a toolbox um, for managing a, a software repositories. And we are also plugin based, like Foreman is, and each uh, type of content that you want to manage is managed by a different plugin. Uh, historically, the RPM plugin uh, has been like the most robust and has had the most users, I would say, and it is probably what drove for Pulp to be created. Uh, uh, Red Hat actually uses Pulp to make all the RPMs that it publishes available to the world. And uh, many other companies actually use uh, Pulp as the system that they distribute their own custom software uh, through. Uh, but in addition to being able to distribute software that you've created, you can also make uh, other software available inside your organization. So as Eric talked about, you know, uh, having uh, your servers being provisioned in different clouds or on premises, uh, you want to be able to make sure that those servers have a very specific set of content available in, uh, on those servers and Pulp is what lets you uh, make that software available and only that software available so that nothing can accidentally uh, you know, be installed that you did not intend to install on it. Um, so we uh, call that use case uh, mirroring of content, uh, but also curating of it, 
where you were able to pull out a certain set of packages and make only that set from the remote repo available. As I mentioned, we have um, multiple plugins. And when I first started working on Pulp, uh, we were uh, actively developing Pulp 2. And it had a limited set of plugins. And the architecture of Pulp 2 was such that it was actually very difficult to add support for additional content types. And there wasn't really a defined plugin API. Every time you had to, you wanted to add a content type to Pulp, you had to go make changes to the core, and then you could write a plugin. Um, or if you wanted to make a change in the plugin, you always had to pair it with a change in core. And so it wasn't a real plugin uh, architecture. And so we, uh, decided to go on this long journey to rewrite Pulp 2 and create Pulp 3. Um, and I say long because it took us about three years to rewrite all of Pulp. And uh, our focus was on plugins and to make it a lot easier to add new plugins to Pulp. And uh, that has actually worked out really well. Uh, for Pulp 3, we now have uh, the RPM plugin, which, you know, as I said, is our most important plugin. Um, but we also have the file plugin, the container plugin that lets you run your own container registry, um, an Ansible plugin that lets you upload Ansible roles and Ansible collections uh, so you can uh, manage your Ansible content for managing your infrastructure. Um, we also have a Debian plugin, which we did have with Pulp 2 also. Um, we have a Python plugin, which is uh, about to release a 2.0 uh, generally available release, which will allow users to create a full mirror of PyPI. And not only uh, create a full mirror, it will let users um, sync uh, multiple times and only sync down like the changes that were made to PyPI. And PyPI is a very large collection of Python packages that you would not want to sync over and over again. Um, Trust and me. I know that one. I, I don't want to be doing that. Been yeah, that. so we, yep. And so we also have a Maven plugin for those Java artifacts. We have a Ruby gem plugin. Uh, and a Chef Cookbook plugin. Um, and we allow our users to choose how they want to uh, fetch this content. We uh, refer to this as the download policy and users can have an on-demand policy, which is what I would recommend for users of the Python plugin when they want to mirror all of PyPI. Uh, because with the on-demand download policy, uh, pulp only fetches the metadata and it know it will know that there is this package available there and only when a client actually requests this package from pulp it will go download that package save and serve it to the client but then it will also um, save it in pulp so that any uh, subsequent request will be actually served by pulp and for content types like Python, it is definitely recommended to use the on-demand policies. And I believe actually Foreman and Catello by default uh, create repositories with the on-demand policy unless the user asks uh, to do otherwise. And um, so we've been doing this rewrite uh, and we actually released Pulp 3 back in December of 2019. And, uh, we released it, uh, we've been releasing about every five weeks a new uh, feature release. Uh, so we are now on 3.7.1. Um, and with each one of those uh, feature releases, we're uh, getting closer and closer to having a feature parity with Pulp 2. Even though we were able to improve the plugin API and we've made for a better REST API, we are still missing some features that we're uh, 
we really want to, uh, uh, you know, get to. And one of the ones that we're actively working on is role-based access control. And we've already actually added um, the machinery that's needed inside of core to provide role-based access control. And now plugins are working on adding that to their feature sets. And uh, we're uh, hoping that that will be done before the end of the year. And this will really allow users to uh, migrate from Pulp 2 to Pulp 3 and have um, that very important feature with their migration. Um, the other things that we're working on as far as uh, feature parity is the CLI. Um, the Pulp users are used to having a tool called Pulp Admin. And in Pulp 2, uh, they can use Pulp Admin to interact with Pulp to create repositories and publish them and check on status of tasks. Uh, Pulp does a lot of asynchronous work, so checking task status is a very important part of the workflow. Um, and so we've uh, started the work on the Pulp uh, CLI, and the command is just called Pulp. It's no longer called Pulp Admin, it's called Pulp. And um, we've uh, sent out a call for feedback on our mailing list uh, earlier today, I believe. Melanie sent this out, uh, asking for users to take a look at this uh, first edition of the CLI so they, we can know if we're doing it right or if we need to change things up before we get too far with it. Um, <clears throat> another uh, thing that we are adding is Ansible modules. And the Ansible modules that we've uh, created are inspired by the Foreman Ansible modules, actually. And uh, they are very popular. Uh, we've noticed that people are downloading them a lot from uh, Ansible Galaxy. And I don't think people are just using, you know, Pulp out there to sync them all the time, which uh, if you look at other packages like Ruby Gems, you'll see that oh my God, my package is so popular, but I suspect people are just mirroring that content all the time. I don't think it's quite the same for the Ansible module, uh, the Ansible collection quite yet. Um, but <clears throat> another thing that we've introduced with Pulp3 is our open API schema. And the open API schema that defines our REST API uh, is what allows us to generate client libraries uh, for Python and Ruby. And the big integration that Eric mentioned between Catello and Pulp3 is using this these auto-generated bindings, the client library, that is allowing Catello me, to make uh, great strides in this integration with Pulp3. And another great thing about the open API is that it not only lets us generate clients in Python and Ruby, I believe it's 40 plus languages that the open API generator supports. So our next uh, client is going to be actually a JavaScript client that we're going to start publishing to NPM. And that client is going to be used by students from University of Massachusetts at Lowell to build a UI for Pulp. Um, Historically, whenever we've uh, been asked about a UI, we've uh, had to tell folks that there's Catello, you can use that, um, but it's a pretty big tool that you have to uh, install, as Eric described. It does a lot of things, it's very useful, but it's not necessarily what every user wants. Um, some users just want to use Pulp, and uh, we want to make Pulp more accessible to users, and having a UI will uh, help us make that happen. And we're really glad that um, the University of Massachusetts decided to help us with this project. Uh, that, 
That's great. That's where I'm from. I'm from UMass Amherst, as I'm an alumni. So it's nice to hear a shout out to UMass um, any day. So well done. Yep. Yeah, and uh, they actually, uh, um, there was a project last semester done by some students from UMass, and it was for Catello. And they did such a great job that we wanted to get their help this semester. Well, we better get them on, um, Melanie, to talk about what they're doing when they get to get to that um, de demo time. Oh, definitely. That would be awesome. Yeah, no, we, we'd love that um, to showcase some of the community efforts that are going on, especially at the universities, too. And um, that, that would be wonderful. Yeah, and so I referred to Pulp as a toolbox earlier. And that's because we provide a lot of REST APIs and our project has been consumed through the REST API for a long time. And you can integrate it into your continuous integration systems or into your you know, continuous delivery or just in general delivery of content. And there are many different ways to make the content available and to curate it, but um, we want to make it more than just a toolbox, but a, a tool also that is a, a little bit uh, prescriptive, definitely, to make it simpler. We have to uh, prescribe certain workflows, um, but I think that will attract more users. Well, I also saw that, saw that there was a uh, Kubernetes um, pulp operator in the works. In your, that's in your, right. There is. Um, it said yep, it wasn't so, production ready yet, but that's right. That'll bring um, in another whole slew of uh, community members too. So, can you tell us yes, a little bit about uh, that effort? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, we have multiple ways of consuming pulp. Uh, one of them is through our Ansible installer, which has a lot of options. Lets you install pulp on. Um, single node, multiple machines, however you choose to. Uh, we also publish a container that is a single container where all the services run inside that container and you can get started using Pulp right away just by running that single container. And then the last option is what you just brought up is the Kubernetes operator. And um, it is not production ready, but it is, functional. It lets you deploy Pulp on Kubernetes and currently it spins up its own database. Um, and one of the things that we'll be working on in the near future is decoupling that and allowing users to bring whatever database they already have running in their cluster um, and use that uh, Postgres database. But uh, to boot this image and you have pulp running it's this is the quickest way to get started with pulp awesome um we have plugins um the list of them is here um there are links to the source code to the issue trackers to the packages on pypi um to the documentation for them. Each one of them has its own documentation site. We are in the process of combining all that into a single site. So hopefully that will that project will finish soon and it will be easier to navigate all of the plugins documentation. Um, we also have a blog where we try to post uh, our progress frequently. Um, we definitely announce our releases, but we also try to announce any sort of um, testing we do. For example, we sometimes do uh, performance testing. We post about that. Um, we have some community updates that Melanie helps us with. Um, we are trying to get back into doing more YouTube videos. Um, we were doing them as we were getting ready for the Pulp 3 release, uh, getting people excited about things. And then over this past year, that effort has slowed down. And uh, when we were having our PulpCon, which was virtual earlier this year, we definitely uh, had requests from community members uh, to post more videos. And 
I agree with those community members and we will start doing that. Well, pumping out the content is really um, kind of key. Um, but then there's also, I, I love the, that you have such great strong docs as well. Um, I think um, we have a tendency, at least in the OpenShift team, to document by blogging or by co creating content and that goes, that fades away. So don't feel too bad about not having a lot of video content, but you've just created a wonderful one today. So uh, they'll, they'll well, be happy with that. <laughs> and we'll get that out and, and push, push this out in the social channels as well. So um, there we have about two minutes left. Uh, Melanie, is there anything that you want to um, incite these guys to um, talk about um, or promote that's coming up on the radar next, like the next HelpCon or conference or thing that we need to make sure that's on everybody's radar? Um, not particularly at the moment, I suppose, from the Pulp team. As Dennis said, we have a call for some feedback on our Pulp 3 uh, proof of concept for the CLI. And, you know, if you do test that there is some swag on offer for that and with the foreman community we have a demo every three weeks and uh, this thursday we have a demo of the latest and greatest changes in the foreman community so that is live on a on a thursday it's in our calendar on the community so if you're interested in joining you're very welcome to attend and ask questions or even talk so i think that's that's everything for now perfect well um, I'm going to get you to send me the links to all of that. Um, we'll push this video out on um, the OpenShift Commons um, playlists um, for the AMA. You're welcome to reuse it, edit it any way you want. Um, and I am just really happy to have all three of you here today um, to share this. It's, it's a great update. Thanks, Eric and Dennis and, and Melanie. Welcome aboard. Um, you're, you're a welcome site um, to have some community support um, behind all of this stuff now. Um, it'll be really great. And as soon as that operator is functional enough, and I think it might be now, let's get it in operatorhub.io and um, get it in front Definitely. of some of the Kubernetes and OpenShift and OKD working group people. Because I think um, if you want people to break things, fix things, and give you feedback, um, uh, the OKD and the OpenShift community definitely um, are good folks to break things. Awesome. <laughs> and, and, and to fix them as well. So yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> let's let's give them a shout out and um, make sure that they're aware of it. We get you um, some more folks contributing back into to Pulp and other places in Foreman. So thank you for all that you guys do, and it's much appreciated. So take care, all. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Bye bye. Yep. Thank you.